We have been on a multi-week series on the favor of God, and we've received some very important and encouraging knowledge and facts and scriptures about the favor of God, and we especially took great comfort as we read in Isaiah 61 about the Spirit of the Lord. If we could go to Isaiah 61, 1, and I'd like it in the NIV, if you can, please, in the International Version, if that's possible. And in that instance, this is what Jesus also read in Luke 4 as he went into the temple and was launching his ministry and his time. And he, he opened this up in the temple, in the sanctuary, in Nazareth, which was his hometown. So he was launching it from there, and he said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me. He's letting us understand that the spirit of the Lord is upon him to declare the anointing that God has placed upon him. Now we understand that this was probably between 700 and 660 BC written by Isaiah that many years beforehand. Interesting enough, these scriptures were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were preserved from all the way back in that time in Qumran. So the Lord is adding a little emphasis, putting, dotting the eye on us that this is genuine and that nobody can refute it if they're willing to receive it. So Jesus is anointing to proclaim the good news to the poor. The poor in what? The poor in spirit. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Next verse. So to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he stopped because it wasn't the time to release and declare the day of the vengeance of the Lord, but that's coming. And that vengeance is gonna be very interesting to see as we read a little bit later in Revelation 17 about where that vengeance is first released upon. What spirit? What causes it? And he said to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and what we received and understand that this year is now. This year is from that appointment. That time that Jesus released it there on earth, went to the cross, and rose in victory to release the prisoners to repair broken hearts, to give us the power and the grace and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the promise and the covenant of redemption and salvation and a covenant of favor. It's a covenant of favor. But I want to make sure that I teach this with balance, that we don't think that we receive favor in anything that we do, that we receive favor however we do things. Favor has conditions of God. But the good news is that he will never pull away that gift as long as we get back in the line. There's a flow of favor that comes from the heavenly places. It's a river. And if we stay in the river, the favor continues. If we venture away from the, the, the river, then favor can be impeded. I want you to understand and to know this. There's an enemy that's against your soul who's also against your favor. And that enemy will use everything within his, his bouquet everything that's in his arsenal, everything that's in his basket to pull you outside, not just to try and steal your soul, but to put you in a place that's defeated. And when we begin to warble away from those things, he gets a legal right here in this earth because he is the prince of this world. And we need to understand that that spirit of Babylon, which we're going to expose in a little bit, that's his bride. The great whore Babylon is his bride. The church is the Lord's bride. Babylon is the devil's bride. And that great spirit, Babylon, that is spoken to is what? It's a merchandising spirit. It's a spirit that, it says, seduces the kings and seduces the people and seduces merchants. Now, lest we get sideways, and I'll get into it a little deeper, Jesus is all about good business. Jesus is all about good business. So anything that teaches that they're secular with business and and not with with the Lord is wrong. Over 60% of the parables in the Bible, in the New Testament that Jesus gave, over 60% of them one way or another have to do about merchandising and business. But what he had to do was teaching us disciplines, ethics, integrity, 
where and when and how to present business and how not to present business, but most importantly, where not to. I'd like to turn the lights down and share this little video with you that we discovered on YouTube, if we could please. Lights down, video up, thank you. Lights all the way, there you go. The Holy Temple in Jerusalem had become a marketplace rather than a place of worship. Lights up, please. Now let's pull this back into balance also. Jesus was not about and being against business. There's two principles we see from this. One of them was that some of the people that were conducting business in the temple, in the church, weren't being righteous, they weren't being fair. They weren't being transparent, they weren't being honest. And the other issue was that it was in the place of his father's prayer and worship. And so there's a place for business and there's a place not for business. The church is not a place for business. I'm not being critical of any one person, but please understand something. I have an assignment. My first assignment is to this house and to this church and to you. I care about you. I care about you. I care about everything about you. Whether we communicate it or not, you can rest assured that this pastor is praying for you and he's praying for you in this house at this altar. For about three or four weeks, I was very agitated as I would come in the house almost every day in my spirit. I couldn't understand what was going on. Finally, I broke down at this altar and I said, Lord, what have I done? And he opened my eyes and I began to see filthy rags hanging from the beams and I saw a soil, a soot that was trying to crawl up to the altar. And he said, son, my house is being fouled. I said, Lord, I forgive me, what have I done? And as I looked at it, he began to let me hear voices and things going on in the house. And then I realized that in my teaching of the favor, I didn't teach about how to be good stewards of favor. So I took responsibility for that. And I wept here before the Lord for a good hour. And then I asked Jim Mariotti to come in with me and to agree in prayer, and we both wept. And so we've repented of that. But now I want to instill in you an understanding. First and foremost, know this, I'm a businessman. You're not talking to a goody two-shoes pastor who goes golfing on Monday to tell everybody that he needs to rest from his service on Sunday, that takes off Friday and Saturday to prepare a message for Sunday, and delegates everything he can to everybody he can. Now, I'm not saying every pastor does that, but many do. Picks up the paycheck, and in a way, I understand. We're supposed to take care of him. I'm a businessman. I work 
I work like you work. I pay bills like you pay bills. I ask God for his blessing and his favor, and I ask him to allow me to be honest and have integrity and not to be lured away. But I've also learned to keep my business out of the church. In that sense, I, I don't try to do business with people in the church. Now, I have an office here, and many times it overcrosses, but that's because I put it all here. It's not because I take the benefit of the house or of the people. So I think I can preach to you like a father. I think I can come to you with an honest heart and say, first and foremost, please, no one take offense. This is not offense. This is a word from the Lord. And this is a word from the Lord for you and for me. And I've already told you I'd stood in an intercession and I sat here and wept before the Lord and said, Lord, this rests on me. You see, to whom much is given, much is required. Many people want to stand in places. You know, they want to be prophetic. They want to be apostolic. But we have to understand that when we walk in those places, we're accountable in those places to the Lord. I take that very seriously. And I take you and Touch Heaven Church and you that are joined to us as the most important treasures that God has trusted me with. You matter so much to me. My weeping wasn't only because of what I saw in the house, it was because I felt as if I somehow had let you down. That's my weeping. And so as I went back and I began to understand a little bit more about merchandising, I found these scriptures. And I found this very interesting. I shared with you a little bit out of Ezekiel while we were worshiping in Ezekiel chapter 40. Four, you know, the first part of Ezekiel is about woe is be me, Israel. And, you know, this was quite a prophet, right? Who, who wants to be like Ezekiel and lay on one side 180 days and lay on the other side 180 days? And I don't know, that's pretty stuff prophecy right there. I mean, you know, that's a whole year of laying on your side. I was just thinking about that. I'll reset in a second. But if you were him and you laid on your right side for 180 days and the Lord finally said to you, okay, get up and shift to your other side, you probably took your time. You probably, you know, oh, oh, oh. you probably said, can I take a few steps or do I just have to stay in the same place? And he went back over to the other side. Because on the one side he received a message and on the other side he received the deliverance of the message. On the one side it was about the suffering and, and, and the problems and on the other side it was about the solution and the promises. And in this instance, we see in verse 19 of Ezekiel 44, he's beginning to restore the priesthood. He's beginning to restore the Levites, the ones that were trusted to minister before him, the priests like you and me, the ones who are given the treasures in their hands, the treasures of God, the ones who are entrusted to be holy before God for the people, for the kingdom, for the hour, as servants. And so what's he do? He begins to get everything back in order, even as he had started with Moses so many years back in Aaron. And in verse 19 of 44, he says, when they go out to the outer court where the people are, they are to take off their clothes they have been ministering in and are to leave them in the sacred rooms and put on other clothes so that the people are not consecrated through contact with their garments. Do you understand what he's saying as priests? What you carry is holy. The garment you wear, that that soaks up the anointing and the praise and the worship in this house and in this altar is holy. You are clothed with a holy mantle, a holy garment. Many times you may not see it, but I assure you the spiritual world sees it. I assure you demons know the garments you wear. And I assure you that the angels in heaven know the garments you wear. JP will tell you that I told him I love my video and audio team, but I'm very disappointed in them because too many times I've come in this house and the worship hasn't been in this sanctuary. It's been off. I don't care if it's a technical glitch. And I'm going to tell you all again, your number one assignment in this house is to keep the worship 24-7 in the sanctuary. 
God forbid if it's off, I hope he wakes you up in the middle of the night and you come here to turn it on. Because we don't do that because of superstition. We do that because we understand that the worship and the praise of the Lord in this house is our gift to give to him and that we carry that garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. People should be able to walk in here and the spirit of heaviness dissolves and goes away because of the garment of praise that's in the house. I've seen angels in this house. I don't preach about angels. How many times have you heard me preach about angels? I tell people, quit preaching about angels. I have brothers that write many books and I love them about angels. And you know, I have one of my dear, dear uncles who's on television all the time. And if you've got an angel story, you're gonna get on his program. That's okay, that's all good. I don't worship and chase angels and I'm not looking at angels to give us our solution, but I can tell you I've seen him in this house in worship. I can tell you that that brings the presence of the Lord. The Lord says, I'm in your praises. But yet he also tells us, don't take the holy garments out to the world and soil them. He says, those are holy. Those are unto me, your priests. Now look what else he tells his priests as he's regathering them. Look at this. This is amazing stuff. Lay them in the holy chambers, and they shall put on the garments, and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. Now, verse 23. And they shall teach. This is what brought me to repentance, the Scripture. Isn't it funny? The Lord opened me up to this five weeks ago, and I didn't have a clue why. I read it, and it was like, oh, okay. Okay, Lord, we're going back to that again. You know, we're going back to Moses. We're going back to changing the garments. I've been there and done that with you. Okay, Lord, but I put a little mark in my Bible for some reason. And man, when I was sitting here on the floor weeping, I said, where's the mark? And I went back to it. And this scripture jumped out and hit me right in the face. It slapped me silly. Verse 23. And you... Priests, you, teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. I said, my God, Lord, my God. And then I realized that, you know, we're a, we're a prophetic church. <laughs> if you're in this church, if you're following these messages, if we're walking together, then we're going to sort of be out front. And I'm not being arrogant, it's a fact. I don't have to prove it. We were out front before the whole world went on pause, he told us. He told us we were coming to it next and he said it would never change again. He's told us multiple times when things were gonna happen and we were on the front, we were a pinpoint on the needle. And you're being a pinpoint on the needle right now to the body of Christ, because the Lord is about to purge the body of Christ of the spirit of Babylon. And he's saying, come out. We'll get to that in a moment. Come out. So yeah, yeah, we bleed a little, we wound a little, we embarrass a little, we, you know, we get a little shook. We have some consequences, but bless God, he loves us enough to tell us to come out and shows us the way and gives us the power. And he doesn't do it in a way to judge us or to knock us down, but in a way to lift us up and to prepare the way for his coming. How can we prepare the way if we're not in the way? How can we prepare the way if our way is obscured by the ways of the world and the ways of the church? How can we prepare the way if we don't know the difference between what is holy and profane? So the Lord is bringing us to a higher accountability You've heard me preach many times, you know, there are truths when they come to us, some people don't want to receive them, so they go eat and drink somewhere else where that's not taught or where it's not required or it's not important. But I often liken it to this, don't I? An ostrich with its head in the ground, but you know what's sticking up. And what's sticking up gets swatted. So you can put your head in the ground, but you're going to get your butt swatted. And so the Lord is saying to us, he loves us so much that he's saying, 
teach the difference between the profane and the holy. How can we teach this generation the difference if we don't practice it? Who are we to tell a new generation that's coming up in an obscure world that's so difficult for us to understand, let alone live in and tell them, walk the way we walk when we're walking a little sideways? Huh? Isn't that a powerful scripture? Teach my people the difference between the holy and the common. That's another word for the profane. You know what another word for the profane is? The polluted. The polluted. You can have a wonderful lake of fresh water. Do you know how much it takes to pollute that lake? A couple drops of stuff that's grown in a lab to pollute a lake will cause that water to be undrinkable. It doesn't take a whole lot to pollute something that's pure of God. But one thing I have learned about God, one thing I've learned about the glory of God, and I've, I've made it my life experience since I've been saved, to keep and keep pressing into the glory of God, is the glory of God cannot mix with pollution. Cannot. Cannot. The light of the glory of God cannot have blemishes on it. That's why he's coming back for a church without spot or blemish. But who does that work? Yes, it's the Holy Spirit, and yes, it's the teaching and the washing of the Word of God, but it's also you and me. It's what we do and what we don't do and how we do it and where we do it. It's really not hard and complicated. It's so simple that maybe it'll cause you to be on your face repenting and crying for an hour or two. Or maybe you don't have to. Maybe you just get it. I needed a transformation in my spirit. I needed a resetting. I needed a realignment. And I'm telling you, I'm not walking. I'm not walking in a foul business. People that work with me and know me, I'm transparent. I demand honesty. We pay our bills. I make sure everybody's paid on time. I can honestly tell you that I'm a good steward of what God's put in my hands, but yet I had to get a realignment because of the place and the how. So please, don't be offended. Pray for me as I've prayed for you. But let's get it right, and let's go on and get some more truths. Can we do that, please? He then goes down to this. You God is so good. <laughs> he didn't leave the Levites there, just like he's not leaving you as Levites here, without an understanding of what you've got. And this is what he says in verse 28. And it shall be unto them for an inheritance. Actually, that's a completely different change, but that's okay, I like it. I am their inheritance, and you shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. Now notice that the way it's written here isn't really a Judaic way. The Lord doesn't just talk in the future tense. To him, everything's past, present, future. So he says, I am. I am the possession. But I like the interpretation because what it's saying is, tell the priests, you really don't own anything. <laughs> Come on. Now you might say, what? I don't know if I like that. I love that. Because it tells me that he's my possession and because of that, I'm a steward. I'm a steward of his possessions. And if I am a good steward of his possessions, then God is going to favor it because it's his favor and his possessions. It takes the responsibility off of me of having to store up possessions. And I begin to understand that the Lord is a priest, as a priest of the Lord, and we'll get into that in a moment also. I don't need to worry about storing up possessions because you're my possession. Now, part of Christianity will tell you you were bought with a price, and that's true, right? Romans, you've been bought with a price. We understand from the Pauline epistles that, and we know from our faith that Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price with his life to redeem redemption of you and I. But once that happened, and once we are in the office of the priesthood, which we are, right? 
Revelation 1.6, I will make you a nation of kings and priests. A nation is a culture. A nation is a peculiar place amongst all of the world. Israel is a nation. The United States is a nation. Kenya is a nation. Every nation has its own set of laws, its boundaries. And by the way, a nation without boundaries is not a nation. Just so you understand that. What's at stake for this country is a nation without boundaries. And the next thing that happens after that is it's no longer a nation. Then people are scattered to what's called a diaspora, and then they're a culture. They're no longer a nation. But you're a kingdom. We are a kingdom. And he says, I call you a nation. And in calling you a nation, I'm telling you, you don't have to worry about possessions. I am your possession. I bought you with a price from my son. And now I say to you, instead of you being my possession, I'm your possession. Whoa. What a gracious God. What a gracious God. That's like, that's like somehow, and, 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 I, and I feel feeble in making this comparison, but maybe it'll help you to understand it. It's like somebody taking the largest amount of money they have, and they pay off all your debts, and then they give you everything you could possibly want, the land, the cars, whatever it is that you're looking for. And you give, they give it all to you. And then it says, that's your possession. That's what the Lord just did. He's abundant. He's got everything for you. And it's all about seeking his kingdom, right? It takes us back to where we started on this journey of the favor. Matthew 6, 20, uh, 32 and 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, we have to emphasize the righteousness. Seek the kingdom, but in his righteousness. And notice it says seek. What that tells me, and as I laid here, it, it, it permeated in my soul, you never stop seeking. You never stop seeking. We have to continue to seek his righteousness in everything we do, every decision we make, every debt we take on, every business that we do, every relationship that we have. Seek the kingdom. Put the kingdom first. Because the altar of that right? The opposite, the altar, is the Babylonian queen, the bride of Satan himself, trying to lure us away from those things that are our Christian ethics, with the same things sometimes that God blesses us with. Think about it. When the blessing becomes more important than the blesser, guess what that's called? Idolatry. You and I would say, we don't do that. I repented of it. It's called idolatry. Maybe it's not idolatry like a pagan Buddha sitting in the middle of somewhere and people lighting incense to it. But to the Lord at his altar, it's idolatry. And it's foul. And it clogs up the favor. And it changes the righteousness. So we're learning. Teach that we might discern the difference. Teach that we might know the difference between what's holy and profane. And profane meaning common also. You know, something about God, there's nothing common about him. (laughs) God is as common as you could get. He's holy. He's creative. He continues to create. Everything is created by him. We're just discovering things that he's already created. He already knows the beginning from the end. He knows his plans and purposes for us. He wants us to walk in those plans and purposes for him. He understands he's not startled by anything. Nothing comes suddenly to God. There's nothing common about him. Nobody can predict God. God alone predicts himself. He prophesies to us, but then he doesn't always tell us time, does he? He has us hold on and wait. We are his children. He's our father. Nothing common about God. And also he wants us to know how not to pollute our relationship with him. You know, it's hard. You know why it's hard? Because many of us are guided and teached. I'm not looking for any points, so it's okay. We're guided and taught by those who walk in pollution many times. 
The business of the ministry is pollution. It pollutes to God. Some have to really work hard to keep their ministries as they grow going, and they have to work just as hard as to keep them pure. And little things sneak in to try to find their way. And it seems good until it's not good. So, the Lord says, He is your possession. Let's talk a little bit about merchandising. I'd like to, I don't have time to read you all four different versions, but they're actually the same. But four counts of Jesus and the money changers. It happens in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's four counts of the story. We understood what we saw. Jesus enters the temple. He gets angry because there's merchandising going on in the temple. Not only merchandising, but people are doing it for their own self-gain, whether it's good or bad. He wasn't against the business. He was about the way the business was be conducted and where it was conducted. And so Jesus, who was made sin, who had never sinned, that you might be made the righteousness of God and were seeking the kingdom in his righteousness, correct? He never sinned. Which means when he got angry and turned all those things over in there, he didn't sin. Wow. Oh my. He didn't sin. It was a righteous anger. It was an anger unto righteousness. But it also showed me that he was so committed to the Father, so committed to the holiness of the Father, that the one thing that ticked him off was a place that was reserved for the worship of the Lord that was doing merchandising. It ticked Jesus off. So much, he couldn't contain himself. I guess he could, but he didn't. He didn't contain himself. He never smacked anybody. Maybe part of letting the sheep and the goats go that we saw was the deliverance, I don't know. But he tipped it over and he made a comment. And out of John, we see a little bit different of an interpretation. All of them got about the same thing. And in Matthew 21, 13, I'm sorry, John chapter 2, 16 and 19, out of certain versions it's quoted this way. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Don't make it a place of merchandising. And then he goes on and he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up because they wanted to kill him. They didn't like the message. You know what's funny? Without Jesus, people still don't get that message. And with Jesus, sometimes we have a hard time, right? You go to the wall today. How many of you have been to Israel? How many of you have been to the wall? Right, you're coming down through, you're coming down to the side to where the wall is and you have to walk through an area, you pay a little bit to get in or whatever it takes, and you have merchandising going on from the moment you get there to the moment you get to the wall. You have people trying to sell you something. Right, the telathem, put it around your arms, bind it up, the little boxed hat that comes on, um, you know, mitzvahs, there'll be a guy there that puts some dye in his eye and his eye will be all red and he'll have his bucket out there for you to give him some money to do a mitzvah on the way to the wall, merchandising. It still goes on and it still tries to take advantage of the hearts of people that come to have pure worship. Because those are good people. Those are sensitive people. Those are family. That's the family of God. Those are brothers and sisters. So we see it's still prevalent. We see that it goes all over the place, doesn't it? Righteous anger. There's a time for it, and Jesus demonstrated that to us. What he was upset about was that they were using the temple of the Lord for their own trades. Now, we're going to talk about a Babylonian spirit in a moment. I don't know what that was. The devil doesn't like this, does he? 
You know why I know he doesn't like it? Because I've been in warfare for five days. I don't glamorize warfare, my wife will tell you. Even to the point that the nastiest, I don't even know what it was. It was so big and hairy and it was dark and it was about this big. That stinking thing bit me on my hand while I was putting my tractor away yesterday. And she saw it. She goes, what was that? I said, I don't know what, I never, I said, it wasn't a bee and it wasn't a hornet, but man, does it hurt! It's all swolled up today. I went, <sighs> spit it out. Cursed it. Enemy's not happy. You know why? Because this is a message for the body of Christ to begin to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. This isn't judgment on the house of God. This is the grace of God speaking to you and me, breaking us to our knees so as sons and daughters, so that we can be those who can come out of Babylon, because Babylon's about to take it in the shorts. It's about to happen. Babylon spirit, you can't mix it with holiness. Today, today, we say Jesus is in the house. We say Jesus is in the house. We should act with fear that Jesus is in the house. Start turning chairs and stuff over. I am so glad that we don't sell anything in this church. We give coffee. We give tea. We give water. We don't sell anything in this church. I am so glad. And I didn't even understand why at first, but the Lord would never let me, even when we couldn't afford to keep the lights on, He would not let me rent this church to anybody for anything. Every week we have somebody that wants to rent this place to have a wedding. And I've had to make some tough decisions because some of the people, I love them very dearly, and one goes here and one doesn't go here, but I can't give this altar to somebody that's not anointed in this house. I can't because it's the Lord's altar, and it's the place where you come, and it's the place that's prepared for you and all that come here in holiness of God. I can honestly tell you, under this watch, our watch, now over 10 years, not one penny has been made in money exchanging in this house. And there's another thing that Jesus was upset about. Now we're going to get down and dirty and then it's going to get good, I promise you. Okay, can we, can we dig a little bit deeper and get some more pus out together? Is that all right, Ralph? Could we, is it okay, son? And I ran all this by Ralph, because I said, Ralph, am I going to get, you know, am I going to have to leave town? He said, go for it, pastor. When there's a spirit of merchandising in a house, not too many good things come from it. People get taken advantage of. People get led into things they shouldn't go to because they either can't afford it or don't know what they're doing or it causes offense. It creates divisions and factions of people, those who do and those who don't, those who have and those who don't. Some things have been going on and I've heard from more than a few of you, well, I would under this person and they made money and it's important who you go under. So this person was upset that that person didn't go under them. What's that called? Division and factions. It's called offense in the house of God. Well, pastor, we met somewhere else. You met with the family of the house of God. What was your purpose? To bless, to edify? Maybe it was. Did it cause offense? Maybe it did. I told you I was going to dig the pus out because I care about you and I care about this house. We're never supposed to compete with each other from this church in anything. Nothing. 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 We're supposed to stand with each other edify each other, 
Build up each other. Work on each other's face. Be never a cause for offense. Always rush to that person for forgiveness. Always, always ask to make things right and to work towards it. I told you, it's going to be a couple head slaps. No offense. It's called correction. It's called opening our eyes. It's called not being ignorant. We do things ignorantly without being intent. I've made so many stupid mistakes ignorantly that I didn't think were intentional, but I hurt people. And it doesn't matter how they got hurt. It matters that I did it. And it matters that I need to ask for forgiveness and to not walk in that spirit. That's the mantle we wear. That's who we are. We're cloaked with a different mantle than the world. And we have to be, first and foremost, you know how people wear those bracelets that was so popular, what would Jesus do? <laughs> and then they'd go do something else. <laughs> what would Jesus do? Well, I don't know, but I think I'm going to do this. No. What would Jesus do? He would make sure he was no cause for an offense to anybody. And that's what he would have us do. He would make sure that we weren't competing for people for anything. Remember something. He's your possession. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he's going to give you everything. I want to caution you of this. It's happened in my life. I've been in the Lord now about 40 some years. And even in the Lord, there was a period of time as I was learning how to do business and still learning how to do business. And, and uh, maybe you all don't know the story. I was on Wall Street. I took a company across Wall Street. Now you talk about vipers. You talk about tough people, rough people. They expected me to be shrewd and tough. They required it of me. I didn't know how to balance it. I thought there was one way you were in the world and one way you were here with business. And do you know, as I looked back and saw that entire thing get wiped out in a matter of a couple weeks with a restart, and God blessed us again, but under different principles. Do you know what I saw? I saw the canker worm. When we don't walk straight in the Lord with the things that we do, the canker worm will take away exactly what we're trying to get. You might think you're storing something up, but the canker worm will give you twice as many bills to eat up what you just had. A tragedy will come. You say, oh, pastor, please don't preach that. I'm talking from experience. Your network might get cut off. Things might happen. You don't ask why. You say, me. What do I need to do, Lord? How do I get right? What did I let in? Don't look to the world and blame the world. The world's going to take you out. You understand that? Don't look for the world to say, oh, we're so sorry. The world is going to take you out. The great whore Babylon, she's going to eat you up and spit you out with the blood of the prophets until the Lord destroys her. And he says when he destroys her, it's going to be in an hour. That's how fast it's going to topple. Okay, I got the tough stuff out. Let me go to this. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 18. talks about Revelation 18. Just start with one. It talks about the angel of God coming down with great glory and bright and light. He's actually coming down with an assignment. And that assignment is to destroy the Babylonian spirit of the world. Do you know what that spirit does? Merchandising. It's the spirit of merchandising. It's the spirit of trading. It's the spirit that that lures people in. And listen to this. With a mighty voice he shouted, verse 2, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every clean and detestable bird. Those are spirits of the air. On and on. The nations drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. The merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. And then I heard another voice from heaven. Whose voice do you think that was? Say, come out of her, my people. 
Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. He's talking to Christians, to believers. Not unbelievers, they don't get that message. They don't hear the voice from heaven. He's saying to you and me, come out of her so you don't get her plagues because I'm going to do some plagues on Babylon. Why do you think the world is shaking right now and there's plagues all over the place? Why do you think they can't figure out we have inflation but so many people got jobs? And, and by the way, not all the people got jobs. Huh? Here we go again. Forget about the minorities. They don't count in the numbers of employment. Their employment's no better. Such a delusion, a spirit of delusion on the earth. We're not in recession, but then, you know, the Secretary of Treasury says the whole world's in recession. They don't even know what they're talking. They're spinning like tops. Spending so much money, we already know we can't pay for it in this country. I mean, if you haven't woken up to that yet, forget about the billions and trillions now. It's a bill that's never, debt that's never going to be paid. That means at some point, it's going to crash in an hour. And that means all the money and the fungible things we have going here and there and wiring and caught up in crypto and everything, boom, gone, gone. You say, Pastor, what should we do? I don't know. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to try to stay out of debt. And I'm going to have fungible assets. Fungible. Hold on to them. Go to the bank and get them. Be smart or ignore the word of the Lord. Teach my people. Teach my people. Beloved, I don't care what anybody tells you, there's a storm brewing. It's called the judgment of God. It's coming down on this earth. Don't let anybody lull you to sleep. Don't let them lull you to sleep. Come out. You want to wait till the last second and come out? That's your choice. Me, I want to say, Lord, help me to come out. I need to know how to come out. Teach me how to come out. Show me how to come out. My wife and I, we made a big mistake. We didn't have a whole lot of money. It was part of her inheritance and some of my mom's and a few's and there was a, what we later learned was a pyramid Ponzi scheme going on. And boy, the first two years of it was great. We're getting 14% interest. We put our money in and all of a sudden, poof, everything was gone. We got about 10% of our money back. Looked good. We brought other people into it. Other people brought us into it. Pyramid schemes always fall, church. Wake up. We lost. We cried. We repented. Not doing that again. Been there and done that. Babylon. Babylon. Look at this one. Verse 23. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. He's talking about the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of merchandising, the great whore to Satan, his bride. The voice of the bridegroom, which bridegroom? Babylon. And the bride, I mean Satan, and the bride, Babylon. That's why I know he's married to her. Will never be heard in you again. Satan, you're not going to have that tool on the earth anymore. Babylon, you're done. I am my church's possession. Your merchants were the world's great men. Pastor, but you don't understand a Christian started that business. You know who have been the people that have ripped me off the most in my life? Christians! Please don't tell me a Christian started a business. I'm just telling you. Huh? You know how many times I've lent money to a Christian and I've never seen him again? Out the door and out of sight. Not even knowing I forgave him already. And I try to forget it. It destroys relationships. 
It causes offense and divisions and factions. That's why Jesus says, don't loan it if you can't afford to give it. Better to give it. Jesus loves generosity. Loves it. And he wants us to be good stewards. Good stewards of what he gives us. Listen to this. I'm almost finished. I may have no church left next Sunday. I don't know. I don't know. Please take no offense, nobody. This isn't... If there's anybody here who's been more stupid than anybody else about understanding how to operate in the kingdom of God with business, you're looking at them. Okay? I could tell you bundle after bungle. I could tell you mistake after mistake. I could tell you being seduced time after time by something that just looked too good. So tantalizing, so sweet, so tasty. And other people look at it, and I, I, I know, I, whoo, maybe it's because the Lord requires a lot out of me. I don't know. I don't know. But I've come to that place where I fear God above all things. And you know what? He answered my prayer here this week. Because I say to the Lord, Lord, if there's anything that my eyes are blind to, please let me see. And he was trying to let me see five weeks ago, and I didn't see. You know why? Because my mind wasn't tuned to that. My mind was somewhere else. That was my fault, not his fault. Look at this. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again, whore Babylon. The voice of Satan in Babylon will never be heard in you again, Babylon. You're dead. Your merchants were the world's important people. Listen to this, beloved. By your what? By your what? By your what? Oh, my God. Witchcraft. All the nations were led astray. That's a seductive spirit. That seductive spirit wraps itself around the lust of the pride of the flesh. Money, competition, these promises, seductive, witchcraft, magic. Do I have to say it any easier than that? Can I open up your eyes and my eyes any more than that? Can I teach the difference between what's profane and holy any better than that? I don't think so. I want to go back to what I said earlier. Jesus is not about making good investments. He's not against it. He's not against good business. He's about where and how you do it and with whom. With whom. You know, I think back about an uncle of mine. He's long gone. <laughs> I didn't understand it then. I was young. But at every family reunion, he'd, have, he'd set up a little table where he brought extra cheeses and all the little things the family liked. You know what I mean? That weren't part of the family reunion. It was, you wanted the delicatessens. You went to his table over there. He was so nice. He brought everything. And then he was selling everybody life insurance. <laughs> Even I bought it. I was only 17 years old. I bought life insurance. I bought a $10,000 policy for 50 bucks I had in my pocket. Huh? There's some places, some places that we need to hold in the highest regard, and some people we need to treat with the best regard. Their relationships, trust, goodness, wisdom, wisdom, understanding. Fear the Lord. Jesus is all about good business. I'm so happy and proud for many of you who have 
ventured out into your own businesses and I pray for you and my prayer for you is that you will do work half as little for twice as much and I know that's happening and I know that's going to happen. I know God's going to bless you in it. And I know you're going to see purely with good eyes the right things to do and the things not to do. And my prayer for you and for me is when we're not quite sure, we just don't go. We just stop. We put it on pause. We put it on pause. Beloved, I could tell you this, and I have scriptures that could back it up, but I'm going to tell you this from a businessman who took a company to a worth on Wall Street of $340 million and watched it go away. To a businessman who's been up and down on his feet three different times, lost fortunes and worked them back up again. I'm talking to you real here now. I'm talking to you real here now. Don't risk more than you can afford to lose. Don't go in debt to try to make money on what you can't afford to lose. Listen to me. And when your age gets older, risk less. That's fundamental. You're hearing that from someone who loves you and someone who's been there. This is not a time to go out over your skis. Babylon's going to come crashing down. She's going to come down at some point. One of the visions I had early on, I had no clue what was going on in my house in Selma Avenue. Over 50-some visions of God. Over that one year, he and I were locked up together with the Holy Ghost. I saw the whore Babylon, all adorned, dressed nice, earrings, jewelries, wealth, everything. He took me up. He showed it to me. And I looked at it, and then all of a sudden, she was stripped naked, just like the word said. She was crying out in torment. Everything went away. And she went from looking like Miss Universe to looking like a 102-year-old decrepit woman in a nursing home. Just like that. I didn't understand it. I said, Lord, what are you showing me? I got it here. He said, son, there'll be a day when I'll have you preach about the naked Babylon. You heard it first here. I'll be preaching it. Because God wants his people to come out. I don't have all the solutions, but he does. I can't tell you exactly what to do and not to do, but he can. But I can tell you this much, he'll help us all through it. It's hard to navigate in the world right now. It's very hard. You know, on the way in, I was praying and saying, Lord, you know, I I don't really want to bash Christian businesses, you know, people. And then I said, well, but I do have one question to ask you. You know, this, this Christian hospitalization, the people that I know that have it have to beg to get their bills paid from it. That's what I know. It sounds good. We're a bunch of Christians pulling our money together to get medical coverage, but everybody I know that has it has to beg to get their bills paid. And some of them don't get them paid. Some of you, if you have it, you spend hours on the phone trying to get them to pay a bill. They give you all the reasons why they're not. They're no different than other medical insurance. They're the same. Oh, but you don't have to worry, Pastor. We all pull our money together. And if you get cancer, first of all, I'm not getting cancer. Secondly, if you do, we're going to be there to pay it. Well, until you get on the phone, you try to get it paid. Be careful. Don't just fall. Don't fall for the marketing. Don't fall for the merchandising. Like me, I encourage you to get on your face. I'm going to get on my face some more this week. I'm not sure what else he needs to deal with, but I feel it gnawing in me. There's some stuff he needs to deal with. And you know what? I want him to deal with it. I don't want to walk in ignorance. I don't want to walk in confusion. I don't want to walk in chaos. I don't want to walk in offense. I don't want to walk in division. I don't want to walk in competition. I don't want to walk profaning the altar. For me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. And we shall worship Him. I don't really know how to end this. I honestly don't. 
what you're seeing is a broken man. My wife will tell you, Patty will tell you. A few of you know I've cried before you in this last week. Broken. Broken for you. Broken because I feel I wasn't listening good enough for you. I don't know how to end it, but to thank God for his mercy and his grace. To repent to him and tell him, Lord, forgive us. Jesus said it on the cross, they know not what they do. You're not bad people, I'm not bad people, we're not bad people, but you don't have to be real bad to pollute the altar. A little leaven just takes a little bit of leaven. And when you're a house that's on fire for God, a prophetic house, a people that are passionate about the things of God, that believe in the healings of God, that believe in the power of God in all things, that believe in, 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 in the sovereignty of God in all things, when we're that kind of people, a little bit of leaven has no place in the fire. No place. We have to get it out together. We have to be committed to it. We're on the verge of some very big things for the kingdom of God, and he loves us so much, he's dealing with us. That's why. Maybe because he's got a servant who doesn't care and is dead enough to say it. Maybe because he has a people that love him enough to hear it. Maybe because he's got nations in your hands and you can't fool around with the things of the world. Souls. People. People.